A new survey finds black people love true crime podcasts. Now, traditionally, true crime has been seen as being for and about white women. But according to the Pew Research Center, 36% of regular true crime content lovers are black. That's compared to 34% who are white. Women are still almost twice as likely than men to regularly consume true crime podcasts. Two podcast hosts hope to use that interest to safely bring back missing black girls. Joining me now are Asa Todd and Nikki Irene. They are the hosts of the Black Girl Missing Podcast. Welcome to the show, y'all. Always love to talk to you. Always love to listen to your content. It's incredibly informative and empowering for our community. What made you want to start the podcast? Nikki, you want to handle that one? We saw a need. Um, we saw a need for a conversation that we were willing to have from a lens that was about centering the girls. It wasn't about sensationalizing or making light of the situation. It was about just laying it plain and saying the things that needed to be said to our community. We are talking to our people about our people. Did that worry you at all, though? Because, you know, talking to our people about our people uh, is the priority. You might still want other audiences, other communities to listen, to pay attention, to consume the content. And the problem sometimes is because, like you said, you're centering our community, you're centering black girls, white people might not care. Sometimes if white people aren't at the middle of it, white people don't want to watch it. Did that worry you at all? It didn't worry me, but I knew that there was going to come a moment where we got negative feedback. Um, we've gotten, you know, well, what about white kids? I don't, un let me bring your partner into this. I, I just don't understand that. White <laughs> women go missing on TV, news shows, true crime stories, documentaries, songs. We, don't we could have five million missing white women and no one says a word. The moment you have a black girl missing podcast, first thing people say is, where's the white girl missing podcast? All of them is miss. Every podcast about missing girls is missing white girl podcast. How did you <laughs> respond to that kind of criticism? It was very much, um, we see the unbalanced media attention that black girls get versus white girls and white women. So if you have a problem with that, you're saying you have a problem with anybody focusing on anybody that is not you. And that's a you problem and not an us problem. Mm. That's, that's a beautiful approach to it. Again, I'm going to center black people and I'm not going to care about what the world thinks. But what you might care about is how the people who help solve these cases uh, respond to your show. Have you all... Uh, made any breaks? Have you seen progress on any of the stories that you've covered? What's it been like? We haven't so much seen any breaks in any cases, but we have gotten feedback from family members of missing girls that we've covered who are just very appreciative that their family members, their loved ones aren't forgotten. Their names are being mm. said and, you know, people care. And I think that's very important, not just, you know, breaking cases and, you know, solving these missing cases, but showing that someone, more than just one or two people, but a lot of people care. That's an interesting point. Let me bring you back in, Nikki. I mean, that's, you know, I keep thinking about, you know, I want to find these people. If they're alive, I want to bring them to their families. If they're passed away, tragically, I want their families to get closure. But I keep thinking about, like, the solving part of it and, uh, I hadn't really considered that, you know, just feeling seen, feeling cared about, feeling like you're not being ignored has to matter to those families, too. Absolutely. Um, we kind of make it clear on our show that we are not looking to partner with police. If anything, we tend to do a lot of criticizing of the way that law enforcement handles these cases. So one of the things that we look at is we break down how the case was handled by law enforcement. We want to look at the ways that law enforcement missed out on something. Um, we want to look at the ways that there was, you know, um, some sort of miscommunication between the parents, some sort of miscommunication with other family members. We look at 
the empathetic part of a missing person because we tend to uh, focus on girls who are under the age of 18. These are children. Mm. And we know that black girls are at risk of adultification from the moment we are conceived. So we right. try to remind people, these are kids. These are missing children. And outside of what the police do or don't do, we like to remember that they did have lives. They are missed. They are cared about. And that even if there were family issues or a uh, unruly teenager or whatever, they're still kids. Is there a, a case or two that's particularly compelling to you? Look, they all matter. They're all important. But there, are there any that stuck with you more than others? Um, for me, the case of Erica Green has definitely been one that's kind of stuck with me a lot just because it showed all of the places where she was failed. Um, she was born um, to a mother who was incarcerated and you couldn't, she could not keep her child while she was in prison. So her child was given to a, a family friend, but nobody actually checked IDs of the family friend, which she had to show, I want to say, I believe, uh, a driver's license and a Sam's Club card to prove her identity. Um, hmm. Thankfully, nothing happened with that particular person. But once her mother um, got out of prison uh, and was reunited with her boyfriend, they basically kidnapped her um, and ended up killing her in a, a drug-induced fit of psychosis. And in that time, we re going through the story, we realized all of the different places that she fell through the cracks. The um, Department of Corrections never contacted the Department of Human Services. So they there was no tracking of where she went after she left that prison to go with um, that family friend. And My God. there was so, a lawsuit. So by, all, by all the institutions failed. Founders. There's 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 like the there's like the yes. bureaucratic failure of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. Mm -hmm. Then there's the failure of our social institutions <laughs> to actually invest in folk. And then there's the actual interpersonal stuff. The people who are supposed to love you and care for you the most, for whatever reason, weren't able to be present and do so. Some for maybe character reasons, right. others for mental health reasons, others all, all the things. It's all the things. And and that's why it's mm -hmm. important to talk about black girl missing. Because our black girls suffer from so many things on so many levels, and you got to unpack all of it. And that's what y'all do on the podcast. So I want to thank you both for making the podcast. I want to thank you both for caring about black girls so much. And I want to thank y'all for hanging out with me on the Grio today. Everybody, you can get more information on the Black Girl Missing podcast by going to blackgirlmissingpod.com. All right, family, we have reached the end of the show. But before I let you go, a word about black children. Sadly, we live in a world where black children, boys and girls, are often not seen as children. We heard earlier in the show about missing black girls going missing because people don't think that they're children who should be located. They don't think that their stories are compelling because they don't seem to have the kind of innocence that their white counterparts do. There's a reason why this happens. As black people in America, we've never been seen as full human beings. And as a result, our experiences aren't seen to be the same as black folk. Black children are denied childhood. We're denied innocence. We're denied play. We're denied access to things. And so if we're going to change this, we've got to change some mindsets. Police statistically see black babies as older and more guilty than their white counterparts. We've got to change that. In our communities, we often think about our children as uh, uh, short adults rather than actual children. We call our young men man-man. When you call your child man-man, you're already sending to him the message that he's the man of the house, the man of the community, that he should be thinking like a grown man and not enjoying all the benefits and spoils of childhood. Let our children have imagination. Let our children dream. But also, let's create institutions that nurture those dreams. We can't have police forces that shoot people like Tamir Rice down for playing with imaginary guns. We can't have schools that don't give people access to recess where they can explore forms of dreaming and playing. We can't continue to produce children who are denied access to the very thing that makes them children, and that's childhood. So let's protect our children's innocence. Let's nurture it. And even more so, let's invest in it. 